In the world of ALS or drug development in general, there's a certain amount of fragmentation in terms of what academic disciplines speak to which areas of the drug development process. And so one of the things we'd like to do as the ALS Association is bridge these groups, and make sure that at a minimum, we're making the connections between disparate groups, disparate interests in the drug development process. Hello and welcome to Connecting ALS, what is now a weekly podcast produced jointly by the ALS Association's National Office and the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter. I am one of your hosts, Mike Stevenson, and I am joined by my new co-host, the Director of Communications for the ALS Association, Mr. Jeremy Holden. Hey, Jeremy, how are things in your world? Things are great. Yeah, I couldn't be better and I uh, couldn't be happier to be here and part of this great initiative. Well, I'm excited to be hosting with you and to launch this format. And we should provide a little context for our longtime listeners. And for those of you who are probably joining us for the first time, Connecting ALS was previously a monthly show coming out of our chapter's headquarters in St. Paul, Minnesota. My co-host Jeremy is in North Carolina. And with this transition to a national audience, episodes will now be made available every Thursday at ConnectingALS.org and streaming wherever you get your podcast. But Jeremy, I will let you provide a little more insight into what exactly we are trying to accomplish with the podcast moving forward. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity. I think with this national platform, we have an opportunity to tell even more stories and tell stories from different pockets and different corners of the world. You know, the people, the research, some of the advocacy fights that are happening and, and the delivery of care is happening across the country. And this gives us an opportunity to really tell more of those stories from more corners of the world. And I'm just, you know, really excited to, again, be part of that. That is well said, Jeremy. I uh, very much agree. And we are so appreciative to those of you who are coming along with us on this journey and giving us a shot for the first time. And those of you who are returning listeners as well. We hope that what we're bringing you each week is very meaningful and relevant content to you. And for our first episode, we thought we would go into some depth on a topic that carries much importance for anyone who was impacted by ALS, and that is ALS research. Jeremy and I had a chance to sit down recently with Dr. Kuldip Deve, the Vice President of Research at the ALS Association, and Dr. Eugene Brandon, the Chair of the Association's Research Committee. Jeremy, we covered quite a bit with these two experts. Yeah, and I felt like the conversation could have gone on hours longer. But, you know, as you have said, I think there's not two better people to really give us a snapshot of, of where we are in the research side of things. And then, of course, where we're going and how we're going to get there. Very true. And, and that said, let's dive into the interview with Dr. DeVay, giving us a broad overlook at where the current state of ALS research is at the ALS Association. The research program has done well this past year. We funded 70 projects or initiatives, a total commitment of a little over $21.5 million. Since the ice bucket funding, we have committed over $107 million, which is very impressive for an organization like this, which is the largest funder of ALS research in the world. Just at a very high level, we fund many diverse areas of uh, research. This can span from basic research, basic biology, where someone's at the bench trying to figure out what proteins may be involved, what genes may be involved in ALS, to translational research, where we fund drug developers, biotech companies, pharma companies, to, to take those ideas and make drugs against those targets. And once those drugs are developed, they need funding for taking them into phase one testing, sometimes testing in phase two to see if the drug is safe and it works. And beyond that, it's also important to fund research that will help or improve people living with ALS today, improve their lives and quality of life. And that research, whether it's in assistive technology development or telemedicine approaches or research into measuring patient and caretaker burden those are the types of research that we fund out of that priority area. 
underneath it all, our research program also funds a lot of infrastructure development. And infrastructure development is great because while we can't fund each and every idea out there, if we fund infrastructure for a trial or infrastructure for data collection, we can help everybody all at once. And so that's really the crux of our our research program. We can't fund everything, but we can fund enough to de-risk and leverage those dollars so that awardees can get significantly more dollars to do to continue the research. That makes sense. Thanks for the, the broad look at how it all happens. You mentioned we can't fund everything. Talk us through how those decisions are made, mm-hmm. what projects to fund. Absolutely. So we're unique in the sense that we fund worldwide projects. There are nonprofit organizations that'll fund in certain areas. Geographically, they will only fund certain topics. Our request for applications, which is how we get new ideas in, applications in, they're open to the entire world. We don't care where the idea, good idea comes from. And so that's the first step of a grant making process is to open that RFA. Sometimes it's completely open as in come to us with your ideas, what we call bottoms up approach. Sometimes we could do a more top down where we say, we're only interested in seeing projects that are looking at inflammation and ALS. So depending on which approach you go with, we get applications in, we review those applications. Sometimes those applications have two stages in a letter of intent or a pre-proposal stage, which is just a two page elevator pitch that an applicant comes in with and says, Hey, this is my idea. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. And we go through those pre-proposals and we invite a portion or proportion of them to come in with their full proposals or a much longer application. Is this done on an annual basis? Correct. Most of, most of our programs are annual. Some programs are launched ad hoc, depending on the needs at that time in the research community. The programs that are annual, they go on our website and we community really knows when we launch them and they know that deadlines are coming up. The new programs, we work with our communications department to make sure the community knows that, hey, there's a new program. This is not something we do each year, but please apply with your ideas. Sure. Once we get full proposals in, that's the time when we put together a review committee. This review committee could be clinicians, basic scientists, people who work in industry. They are essentially experts in that area that we are trying to review. So if it's a therapeutic grant program, then most of the reviewers will be people with drug discovery background. If it's a managing ALS program, it would be people who are experts and key opinion leaders in clinical management of ALS. This ad hoc review committee then reviews the grants, scores them, provides critiques, and provides recommendations to the ALS Association on whether it should get funded or it should not get funded. Or if it gets funded, these are the changes we are recommending that the project make, which, by the way, is also very unique to our organization. We allow our reviewers to shape the project to make it better. So we don't just decline the project the way it's written. And so once these recommendations come in from the review committee, I then present those recommendations to the research committee and Eugene Brandon and others of the board of trustees who make up this research committee will eventually approve funding for those projects. Dr. Brandon, tell us a little bit about that side of it when you get involved, sort of how that all unfolds. So the research committee is made up of volunteers. Most of the members of the research committee are trustees of the association but they are not all necessarily scientists. We have a variety of people that come from all walks of life, but all are familiar with ALS. Sure. And it's important to us that we do our research program from the perspective of the patients, the people living with ALS. They're our number one constituents and concern. And so what we're doing currently is we look to the patients to drive 
solutions based research. Okay. So in other words, is there an issue that is beyond say the biology of neurodegeneration? There's an issue that we can do research on that's uh, beyond basic research. Maybe it's more applied research Then we can do a program for that type of issue. Okay. So we want to listen to our patients first and foremost, and we have patient advocates. We have patients, people with ALS on the research committee. So it's important that we get the full perspective and always are beholden to the most important stakeholders in, in the equation. Right. So we are largely listening to CALDIP and the research staff at the ALS Association on recommendations for which grants to fund, but we don't just blindly rubber stamp Mm -hmm. the recommendations. We think about them. We have a a two-way street in discussing with the research staff as the volunteer committee, the, the, the research committee and the research staff work together to make sure that we have a well-balanced portfolio of research projects. There have to be some difficult decisions along the way. You're getting so many of these applications, many of them sound promising up front, I imagine. When it comes down to the nitty-gritty and you're saying, we're, we're planning on funding this, we're considering maybe not funding that, do you vote? Is Are you reaching some kind of consensus? When you have to make the tough decision, what do you do then? We work with the staff to develop the RFAs, the requests for applications in different programs, and those include the drug development awards, which will typically go to a small company who's got something that's promising for ALS. Maybe it needs preclinical testing or is even entering a clinical trial. Those investigator-initiated awards, which typically will be to better understand the biology, maybe to an academic researcher, to better understand the biology of ALS. And it's also important that we fund the future of ALS research and researchers. And so we have the Milton Safenowitz postdoctoral fellowships. And so in that way, we can encourage scientists who may be near the field or in a related field to focus their research towards ALS and our mission. So in each case, we're trying to drive people towards the mission of the ALS Association, which is to come up with solutions for people in need today as well as in the future. I was struck by something that Dr. Brandon was saying there about driving new people into the field, how we're finding people who may not think of themselves or or naturally gravitate toward ALS research and really kind of expanding that roster and how they were talking about really balancing the the need to empower people who are living with ALS today while also driving forward the momentum on finding treatments and a cure tomorrow. Yeah, that's so important that we keep our eye on the future. Obviously, the ALS Association and others in the field are doing everything we can to help those currently living with ALS and their families live higher quality lives. But you have to think about the next generation, who's going to carry the torch and who's going to ensure that this momentum and the progress that we've made in the last five years really since the Ice Bucket Challenge is sustained and that we really are taking meaningful strides towards uh, first treatments and trying to slow the progression down and then ultimately uh, the cure that we're all hoping for. Yeah, and and how our research program is is supported Supporting that mission uh, is something that I think we get into in the second half of the conversation. So uh, maybe we can jump back in. Sounds good. From a strategic perspective, we're setting that agenda. You, Dr. Dave, you talked about what, what is the proposed outcome of the drug, or, or what is the drug biologically trying to target? Correct. Are you looking for a broad portfolio? We know what we know about ALS, and we know what we don't know about ALS. And we don't know a lot about ALS. We don't know what the causes are. We don't know what the underlying biology is. We, we have an understanding of pathologically what happens. We know neurons are dying in brain and spinal cord. But we don't have a very good idea on exactly this target and this pathway. And most likely, it's not going to be just one target or one pathway. Our human body is made up in a very redundant fashion. And so 
multiple targets, multiple pathways are going to be involved. And so right now it's in our interest to keep a wider door or open door policy for what targets and pathways are coming in. You know, that doesn't mean that we're completely going in blank here. We know that there are certain pathways in your body like inflammation, like autophagy, like mitochondrial dysfunction that have been shown to be involved. And so some of those pathways may get a much better look because we have a lot more information on. I just want to add that we've learned a tremendous amount in the last 10 years, even the last three years Mm -hmm. in terms of the biology of ALS. So that all this money that's been spent, although we still today do not have a very effective treatment for ALS, a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of people's time and energy and passion has gone into better understanding ALS, including trials that have not panned out in terms of efficacy. And all of this information is useful, valuable information. And information builds upon information. And especially now with more sophisticated databases and information technology, we're able to collect information. There's now abilities to do single cell omics, for example. Mm -hmm. We can understand all the proteins expressed in this microglial cell type versus that microglial cell type, for example. All the RNA that's found in these two different cell types. There's just an amazing amount of information now. So in terms of drug development, we're open-minded. We want to keep a balanced portfolio, as you suggested. And then we also have to look at the pragmatic side of things because can this project really be done in the way that the grant applicant is suggesting? Is it really something that can be translated into a treatment that can be applied to to many people with the disease. And so there's a lot of considerations as we decide what should should not be funded, but an open-minded and balanced portfolio is certainly an important part of our, our strategy. And I've heard each of you mention milestone-based funding in various presentations that you've given and why that's important to make sure that studies and trials are progressing in a way that was originally intended and that they're yeah. making the progress that we need to see before just fully funding them in case things don't really work out. That's key, right? Yeah. So maybe just for the audience, let me describe what we mean by milestone-based payments. So let's say a grant gets $200,000 award for two years. In that scenario, typically they may get $50,000 at the start of the grant. And then $50,000 at six months, $50,000 at a year, and $50,000 at one and a half years. And at each of those six-month time points, when there's a payment tied to it, we ask the awardee to send us a progress report. It's not very long. It's generally one to two pages. But there are two or three reasons to do this. One, we want to make sure that the investigator is doing the work that we funded them to do. Not that we don't trust the investigator will do that, but, you know, science can be exciting and it can lead you to many different paths. When we had initially made the decision to fund them, we had funded a particular hypothesis, a particular project, a particular with a particular outcome in mind. And we want to make sure that that's what the investigator is working towards. So that's one reason why we asked for these updates. And then if, if, the, if the milestones are met, we release the payment so that they can keep doing the work. Another reason to do it is, you know, science is unpredictable. And sometimes maybe what they were supposed to do in the first six months didn't pan out or their hypothesis didn't work the way it was supposed to. And this way, if the, in, if the investigator comes back to us in six months and says, hey, you know, I was going to work on that model and then use that model to test my hypothesis, but the model didn't even work out. Now I can work collaboratively with that investigator to maybe shape the project differently, maybe reshape it so that we have different outcomes, maybe try another approach to get to the same outcome. So it becomes an iterative process. It's an open communication. It's collaboration with the investigator. And so this is not meant to be, you know, if you're not doing this, you don't get the money. It's meant to be, if you're doing it great, and if you're running into 
problems, how can we help you? Mm -hmm. Can we partner you up with somebody that has a model that, you know, so that yours isn't successful, maybe they can help you with that. That's logical. That's sort of the the goal here. Yeah. Dr. Rannon. I wanted to speak uh, to the values of our research program. So these may seem obvious to some, but I think it's important to be explicit about it. And the values that we think about are integrity, transparency, and accountability. And the integrity piece comes from having our grants and our grant applications reviewed externally. So it's not just Kuldeep and I thought it was a good idea. We look to experts across the field and even orthogonal to what what we're looking at as as an applicant or an application and try to best get an objective view of the value of a given application. Uh, In terms of transparency, I think it's important that to protect everybody really and to be open about what we are doing and where the donors' funds really are going All the projects are posted online. Mm -hmm. So once a grant is made to a grantee, then we are open about what the project is. Obviously, we don't disclose any proprietary information, but anybody can come to our website and see, okay, there's, there's a grant at this institution nearby for this type of approach. And so I think that's really helpful just in terms of making sure that everyone's on the same page. We need to make sure that we're stewarding our donors' dollars appropriately and that the donors feel like we're doing the right thing because often the donors are people living with ALS. Mm -hmm. And so we're very responsive to our constituents in that way. The third thing is the accountability. And this is what Coldip was speaking about in terms of having milestone-based payments, for example, just making sure that the money is not just going into a black hole, it's going to someone and they're doing what we all agreed made sense to the association and to the research community and and to the people living with ALS. So those are the, the three probably most important values of the research program, which are integrity, transparency, and accountability. I've heard each of you speak when presenting to a crowd about expanding the footprint of ALS research. For our listeners, what does that mean when you say expanding yeah. the footprint? Yeah, so let me, let me first explain what I mean by, a, by the footprint. And really, that, that's our reach. That's our scope. Mm-hmm. And again, there are organizations out there that will say, I'll only fund basic research, I'll only fund translational research, I'll only fund biomarkers. And that's okay. There's nothing nothing wrong in having a f- more focused program. As Eugene mentioned earlier, we do that here as well. We have focused programs on particular topics, or we have open programs where people can just come up, come to us with their ideas in whatever topic they would like to investigate in ALS. And, and through that type of strategy, our footprint is fairly wide. We fund, uh, as I mentioned earlier, basic research, translational research, research into biomarkers, into telemedicine. We fund large gene sequencing approaches. We have funded looking at environmental risk factors and how they relate to ALS. We fund development of research tools like antibodies, animal models, things that could be used on the bench. We funded, you know, early clinical trials. So that's our footprint. It's, it's fairly wide. There isn't an area in research and development that we don't touch. But we could do more. There are areas that are up and coming. And there are areas that we are already funding, but maybe we're funding at volume two and maybe they could be funded at volume se- six or mm-hmm. volume eight. So mm-hmm. turn up turn up the scope on those topics. And so that's what I mean by expanding our footprint on the research field. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brandon, Dr. Dave, for uh, coming in and giving us this uh, in-depth look at the ALS Research Program at the ALS Association. Really, really valuable. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. 
Thanks again to Dr. Kuldeep Dave, Vice President of Research at the ALS Association, and Dr. Eugene Brandon, a board member for the association. Really great insight that they were able to provide for us and just couldn't be more thankful for their time. Absolutely, absolutely. And we will put some links into the show notes for anyone interested in learning more about ALS research and how they can find those things on our website. Be sure to subscribe to Connecting ALS wherever you get your podcasts or visit the website at connectingals.org to stream and download from there. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter, so feel free to give us your feedback on the show on social media and hit us with any questions you might have. We want to hear from you. Jeremy and I will be back next week, uh, which we're going to be discussing what next week, Jeremy, remind me. We're going to be talking about care services. I had an opportunity to sit down with Mark Kalmas, who chairs the Care Services Committee for the ALS Association's of trustees and with Dr. Neil Thacker, the executive vice president of Mission Strategy, to just get a sense of, of where we are in terms of the delivery of care. Again, I thought a really great and insightful conversation. That was a robust discussion. So we're looking forward to sharing that with you next week. All right, that's going to wrap up this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Connecting ALS is produced by Garrett Tiedemann of the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter of the ALS Association. Thank you all for listening, and we will connect with you again next Thursday. Thursday.